You are listening to the Everything Ham Radio Podcast. This is episode number 48. Today we're going to be continuing our discussion on some emergency services uh, organizations in amateur radio by talking about the Amateur Radio Emergency Services, or ARIES for short. We talk about the Bridgeland Amateur Radio Club in Logan, Utah in our Amateur Radio Club Spotlight. We talk about some upcoming events and a contest, as well as a single ham fest in the next two weeks, and wrap it all up with some news from around the hobby. So stay tuned. Hey everybody, welcome back to the Everything Ham Radio Podcast. My name is Curtis, my call sign is Kilo5 Charlie Lima Mike, and I am the host for this podcast. This podcast is released every Thursday morning. You can listen to us on iTunes, Stitcher Radio, Google Play, several different places you can listen or directly from the website. You can find us on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash everything ham radio, on YouTube at youtube.com forward slash everything ham radio, and on Twitter at K5CLM. So today we're going to be talking about the Amateur Radio Emergency Services, or ARIES for short, in the Tech Corner segment of this episode. Now, before we get started, I want to talk to y'all a little bit. Last episode, I told y'all that the uh, the guys over at uh, Ham Radio 360 bought me this great uh, Christmas present, this early Christmas present, and told me not to wait until Christmas. Well, you're listening to it, guys. I got a brand new Audio Technica ATR 2100. Well, some other stuff happened to me, like oh, I don't know, a couple days later or so. And it's great news, but I can't really say a whole lot about it. But because of this great news, I've been able to get some stuff. Get some stuff that I needed. And I'm sure you probably can figure it out, kind of read between the lines, but I can't officially say anything until the first. That's episode number 50, which will come out the first Thursday, or yeah, the first Thursday of the new year. So, a um, couple things I wanted to talk to you all about beforehand as well. Um, this last Tuesday, um, today actually that I'm recording this, um, Ham Radio 360 got a brand new episode out about the Amateur Radio Emergency Data Network. I haven't listened to it all. I am still listening to it uh, as, uh, well, I can't, not right now as I'm listening, but or as I'm recording this, but um, so far there's some really great information on there. It's something that I really enjoy um, and that I would really like to set up here locally. Um, I know there is a club here uh, not too far away from me that has a pretty good network, but I would like to get it here, you know, pretty well co- good coverage in our county. I don't know really how to go about doing that uh, on the budget that I have, but um, I, I would really think that that would be an awesome situation. So head on over to Ham Radio 360 and check out their latest uh, episode. And I also had one back. Um, I don't remember the episode number off the top of my head, but I actually did a podcast episode about uh, ham mesh networking. So check back in the um, in the archives of this podcast if you want to listen to that. So um, I guess that's pretty much all of the announcements that I get, uh, except for one. Um, the last Thursday of the month, I'm actually going to be skipping that episode. Um, you'll have this episode, you'll have one more episode, and then it'll be Christmas time. Um, I'm not going to record anything over Christmas. I'm going to take some time off, some time with my family, and start back up the first of uh, like so I think it's like the second of January is when the first episode will come out in January, and we'll have some great news. We'll have um, some hopefully some great content. Um, if there's anything that you would like to hear, I am working on the content calendar for the upcoming year, and uh, so please uh, let me know if there's anything like you, that you would like to hear. On that same topic, uh, please let me know what you think about this podcast. Uh, you can go to everythinghamradio.com forward slash survey and take a survey there. It kind of gives like a multiple choice, multiple choice uh, question or answers on each of the segments that I do in this podcast, as well as some feedback that I would love to hear from y'all. Uh, you know, your favorite type, your least favorite type, what you would like to hear, um, and other critiques. Um, so please head on over there and take that survey and uh, give me your honest opinion. So I guess without further ado, let's go ahead and get with the episode or the uh, tech corner for this episode where we talk about the amateur radio emergency services. 
Okay, so first off, what exactly is ARIES or the Amateur Radio Emergency Services? Now, in last week's episode, we talked about RACES, and the week, the time before that, we talked about Skywarn. And if you remember last episode with RACES, RACES is governed by um, FEMA and the FCC, and you have to do a lot. You know, it's basically with RACES is during an event. Well, ARIES is after a event, after a disaster. And ARIES is typically what is used for things like a bike race or a marathon or a walkathon or a parade or something like that. A lot of times the ARIES organization of a county or of a local area is what handles that situation. Or at least maybe around here. Maybe it's not that way with uh, with other areas. But... T- um, Aries is, is the organization of the three that we've talked about so far that will handle those type of situations. So what exactly is it? Well, Aries is an organization that was started by the ARRL, and it consists of licensed amateurs who have voluntarily registered their qualifications and equipment for communications duty when a disaster strikes. Every licensed amateur is eligible, eligible to apply for Aries membership, whether or not you have a membership to the ARRL or not. So, if you have any kind of inkling or drive to volunteer for some kind of disaster help, Ares is, is probably the best organization to join. Now, like I said in the last episode, there are a bunch of overlapping areas. You know, RACES is typically, or a lot of times, the same team as the Ares team is. And you'll work under the RACES flag during a, a uh, during the immediate event, and then work as an Aries team. You'll kind of switch hats or whatever uh, after the fact. Well, also, like I said last week, Racies and Skywarn typically work together. But a lot of times, Aries does the exact same thing. You know, you'll work a uh, a Skywarn, a, a medical uh, event or a medical disaster or something like that. Not a medical, <laughs> a weather related event, and. Right after that, you'll switch into Aries mode, and basically, where that consists of is things like um, you know disaster or um, damage assessment, uh, search and rescue, um, you know things along those natures. Things that are not quote unquote time sensitive as much as a races event would be, but it's still just as important. So let's talk a little bit about the organization of actual Aries itself. Aries is broken in, into four levels. You have your national level, your section level, district, and local. The district level is not always used, so you know. I guess maybe the main things would be national, section, and local. The national level uh, is coordinated by the ARRL headquarters, by the ARRL field and services and field sport manager or his or her designee. They are responsible for advertising all Aries official Uh, officials regarding their problems, maintaining contact with federal government, and other national officials concerned with amateur emergency communications potential, and in carrying out the ARRL's policy regarding emergency communications. So basically this is like the top level manager, like the CEO of a company is what the national level of ARIES is. They're the ones that work with the high level officials in other areas and other organizations, and that's where they come from, where they work from, stuff like that. The next level is the section level. Now, each um, area is broken down into sections. And off the top of my head, I don't know how many sections there are, but there's quite a few. And here in Texas, there's actually three of them. You know, granted, we're a really big state, but there's three of them. There's North Texas, South Texas, and West Texas. And each section manager will appoint a section emergency coordinator. Now, their responsibilities are support and help to grow their section, their participation in the ARIES functions. They're the person responsible for collecting all of the um, activity reports from either the local emergency coordinator or district emergency coordinator, if there is one, um, and consolidating all those reports, and they will report to the section manager and to the ARRL headquarters. Um, they're responsible for maintaining a good working relationship with state and local governments. Uh, civil preparedness, the uh, Federal Emergency Management Agencies, uh, Salvation Army, National Weather Service, etc. They're like your your middle management, if you will. Now, in some sections, you they will break down 
a section into districts. In I'm not actually I'm not exactly sure if there's actually districts here in my section. Um, I looked on their website; it's kind of outdated, unfortunately. Um, and I know there's several uh, assistant. Um, well, the it has assistant section managers. Um, I don't know if there's assistant or if there's district emergency coordinators. I would think there are, you know, since we're so big. Um, but I, I honestly I don't know. But basically what this is, in, in like larger sections, the, the uh, section emergency coordinator, he, he or she has the option of breaking down the geographical area into smaller, more manageable areas. And if this is done, the section manager would make a recommendation to for district emergency coordinator to the section manager, and then they would in turn appoint him. Uh, this person is kind of like the go-between between the local area and the section level. Um, and basically has the same duties as the section emergency coordinator, but only on a smaller scale. So you might have, like in in my section, I think there's something like, um, I want to say like 40 counties or something like that. So you know maybe they break up the section into four quadrants. So each section emer- or each district emergency coordinator will have only 10 counties under under their jurisdiction. Now. Whenever the section emergency coordinator is not available or is out of pocket or, um, you know, for, for whatever reason they're not there, the district emergency coordinator has all of the rights and pl- privileges and stuff like that of the section one for his geographical area. Now, the, the, district, can, the district EC can go into another district and, and do that unless, you know, permission is given or whatever, but typically they'll just be responsible for their local area. Now, this might be, you know, like I said, you know, a couple counties. It might be a geographic, a um, um, repeater coverage area. It might be um, a, a, a major city, you know, like Dallas or Houston or, or New York City or something like that. It might have its own district coordinator. So lastly, we have the local level. And each local level has their own emergency coordinator that's appointed by the section emergency coordinator. Now, the district emergency coordinator, if there is one, has a say-so or has can give recommendations on who they want as their local EC, but um, it, they're appointed by the section. Um, the local level EC is probably the most hands-on of all the other levels and is probably responsible for more as well, at least more um, hands-on type things, you know. Granted, in your higher levels and your section levels and stuff like that, you have all these different local level local level areas that they're responsible for. But it's kind of more maybe just like paperwork type thing, I guess maybe. Um, unless a, a disaster happens or something like that, then they can come down and they can assist or they can you know take command or whatever uh, of the uh, amateur radio cord, uh, communications branch of the disaster. The local level, on the other hand. They have uh, a lot more um, responsibilities as far as what goes on. You know, there are some examples here. Um, promoting and enhancing uh, the activities of, ADA, of the ARIES organization to benefit the public. You know, they're the ones that are um, responsible for you know, getting the word out that ARIES exist, trying to raise the membership of that local uh, ARIES group, um, they will manage and coordinate training, organizations, emergency preparedness of interested amateurs in the area. So they will be, they'll be the ones responsible for, you know, bringing somebody in to give a class or making sure that each of the area's volunteer has their uh, training that they need, which we're going to talk about here in just a little bit. And they're the ones, you know, that will work with other agencies. They'll work with the uh, local emergency management team. They'll work with the sheriff's office, the police department, whatever in the areas that, that they serve and maintain a good working relationship because you never know what's going to happen. You know, here locally, a uh, little sidebar here. Here locally, probably, um, I'd say probably 15 years ago or so, our amateur radio group didn't have a great working relationship with the uh, with the sheriff's office, with the local police departments, with the Salvation Army or Red Cross or whatever, we were kind of the outcast. And whatever the reason that may be, whether it was because you know we um, 
you know, we thought too much of ourselves or wanted to do so more than what we should have or stepped on too many toes. I don't know. But as, after uh, about 15 years ago or so, we started working on that relationship. We started getting more um, help from the served agencies that we would serve. And it was delicate. It was a delicate uh, balancing act for a while. You know, we didn't want to step on too many toes. We didn't want to, you know, just go in there and say, well, I'm an amateur radio operator. I, you know, this is what I do. And this is the only thing I do. You know, so we didn't want to try to step on too many toes. We didn't want to um, do things that kind of push what we do onto somebody else. Because that would just make it go, well, well we don't need you. We, we're, we have communication just fine. And it really wasn't until... A lot of people got involved, and we worked well together. We had a couple incidents. We, we, you know, maintained that working relationship. But now we have a great relationship. We have a emergency manager for the county that is very supportive of the amateur radio community. Um, the local police department, where the club that I'm vice president for, um, we have a great re- working relationship with them. We work on all the uh, the parades that they do. Uh, any university graduations, um, any um, uh, any major events, if they have a lost child or something like that, they'll call our club and activate us. Now, our club is not an Aries organization, but they will still call us. And if they do call us and we need extra manpower, we have the Aries group in the county that we can pull from and several other clubs as well that we can pull from. So establishing and maintaining a good working relationship with uh, local and state government officials, other agencies, stuff like that. That's also part of the local EC's uh, responsibilities. Um, another part is to develop local operational plans with served agencies and partners in their jurisdiction. So, like I just said, you know, we had this issue where you know this is what you know we would tell people this is what we do, and this is where we're going to set up, and and so on and so forth. Well, you really can't do that. You know, you really need to say, what do you need? You know, this is what I can provide. Where do you need? Where do you need me? What can I do to help you? And a lot of times, you know, this will be, say, you know, setting up in a Red Cross shelter or setting up a station at a, um, a distribution center or setting up a, a station at the emergency operations center, which we have permanently anyways. But all these different things, you know, you need to work with your served agencies, with your sheriff's department, with your, you know, your law enforcement, your uh, fire, um, your Red Cross, Salvation Army, whatever emergency services that you have in your area. You need to make sure that and you establish and maintain a working relationship with them so that when the time comes, they're going to call on you and they're going to say, hey, I need your help. You know, what can you do? What can you provide me? So, you know, that's something you really need to work on. And it's something very important as well. You know, I, don't, I can't stress this enough. Your working relationship with your served agencies is probably one of the most important things that you can do as a ARIES organization. Another um, one of their responsibilities is to establish your local communications network. Now, whether that's a group of hams that work together and use a certain repeater, you know, their, res- their responsibility is to make sure that that repeater that your uh, that serves your county, we have permission to use as an ARIES organization. Um, another thing would be setting up a uh, emergency data network, you know, like the ham mesh, ham mesh network, something like that. Um, you know, establishing some way of working together and communicating with each other whatever that may be, whether that's, you know, simplex, whether that's uh, using a repeater, whether it's using HF, whether it's using data or PSK31 or RIDI or whatever. One of their responsibilities is to make sure that there is a communications network set up so that it's there and in place when it's needed. Another thing that they do is to make sure and establish a emergency communications plan. Now, anytime that you have a disaster, you have to have something in place beforehand. You know, training is probably one of the most important parts of any organization, whether you're talking about amateur radio, whether you're talking about law enforcement, fire, whatever. Training before a event happens is probably the most important thing that you can do. Because if you just 
you know, if you have no training at all, okay, and a disaster happens and you're placed as being net control, well, you're going to fail miserably. You're going to miss things. You're going to say something wrong. You're going to send somebody somewhere where they shouldn't. You're going to not log everything. There's so much that can happen that if you don't have proper training, that, that can happen. So working beforehand and setting up some kind of plan is something that you need to do. Now, with this plan comes, you know, okay, you say, um, okay, well, Red Cross is going to have two shelters set up on, you know, from the get-go on any emergency, and you need a ham radio operator at each at each location. And the um, Salvation Army is going to have a, uh, a food truck set up somewhere, or the... Um, uh, Adventist Community Service is going to have a, a clothing distribution service uh, or a c- center set up, and they need somebody. And you need somebody at the um, sheriff's office. You need somebody at a fire station, and you need somebody here and there and yonder. Well, if you don't know beforehand what you need, you're not going to know where to go, right? You're going to be two steps behind in the emergency situation, and that's not a good place to be. So you establish what you need what you have in place or what you have so you can put it in place so that if you have a disaster that comes up you automatically know well I need two operators for the shelters I need uh, three operators for each fire station I need one operator for the emergency operations center I need one for the sheriff's office I need one for um, Salvation Army I need one for the community service for the clothing distribution you have all this in place beforehand And if you have operators that you can assign these beforehand, they automatically know where to go. You know, that's one way of doing it. Another way of doing it, just have the positions that you need filled, known, and then when somebody checks on, you can say, okay, well, I need somebody here. This is where I need, or whatever. So planning is probably the second most important thing when it comes comes to a ARIES organization or any organization for that matter. Uh, training is number one. Planning is number two. You know, there, there's so much more that the local EC does and is responsible for, but those are just a few. Um, there will be more in the show notes. I'll have links to um, several things that you really should read if you're going to be involved at all with the uh, amateur radio emergency services. So um, let's go ahead and uh, take a go to the next section, okay? Next section is training. Like I said, the training is probably the most important thing you will ever do with anything in your life. You know, you, you've trained on doing something from the moment you were born, basically. You train to eat. You train to go to the bathroom. You train to um, get your ham radio license. You trained in school to become a, a better adult and to be a, a productive member of society. All this training is something that you're always going to do. You're always going to be training. You're always going to be learning. And it's a never-ending process. Now, when it comes to amateur radio or ARIES in particular, there are several things that need that you need the training for. You know, like we talked in RACES last week, there are two NIMS courses that you need that you have to have in order to be a part of the group. And this is nationwide. Um, And that's the NIM system, the IS-100B and the IS-700A. Those are the two courses that you absolutely have to have. And that is because of the National Incident Management System that was put in place by the Department of Homeland Security back in uh, shortly after um, 9-11-2001. Now, there's also some other things that might be required by your local agency, might not. Uh, They might be optional. Um, Either way, they're good information to have. Um, and those are uh, several ARRL courses, the EC-001, Introduction to Emergency Communications. Um, and the other is the EC-016, Public Service and Emergency Communications Management for Radio Amateurs. Both of these are paid courses. Um, the Introduction to com- uh, Emergency Communications is a $50 course if you're a member of the ARRL or 85 if you're not. Um, I don't remember off the top of my head what the EC-016 is, um, but you can find that out. There is links in the show notes. Um, If you are going to be serving as a public information officer for either your club or for your areas group or, you know, even for your 
uh, your your work or something like that. Um, the AWRL offers a course which is EC015, the AWRL Public Relations course. And it's a good course to have. You, you really should take it if you're going to be the public information officer. Um, what the price of this is, I don't know either. Another thing that you really need, that, or that you probably will need, is Skywarn Spotter training. Now, with races and Aries, a lot of times they double over as Skywarn teams, so they may re- you, your local group may require you to have that. Um, if you're going to be doing it at all, I would highly suggest it. And typically, you have to have this once every two years or so is what's required. But it's good uh, information to have whether you go to it every two years or every one year. So I would highly recommend going every year because every time I go, I learn something new or I learn something that I forgot or there's different training or trainer or whatever and they teach differently and you learn something else. Um, so along the lines of training, what are you good at? Are you a good multitasker? Are you good under stress? Do you uh, enjoy fixing things? Do you enjoy building things? Are you organized? You know, whatever it is, make sure that you tell your local EC or your Aries team what you'd like to do, what you would like to learn about. Because if you're a good multitasker and you're good under stress, maybe you'll be good at being a net control. And you can train to become a net control. Um, If you're good at fixing things, maybe you're a carpenter by trade or, or a general contractor or something like that. You know, I'm sure there's probably something that you can use your skills for to help out in the Aries. If you like building things, you know, a DIY type, um, you know, emergency communications equipment or something like that, you know, maybe you can help your local group uh, fixing radios or fixing a repeater if it goes down or, or building antennas or something like that. But either way, whatever it is that you're good at, make sure that you tell your team what it is because maybe they need that. Maybe they have that need in their group that nobody else can do. You know, maybe they need extra extra net controls. I know that a lot of people do, a lot of organizations do, because being a net control is not for everybody. And, you know, just like with my job, being a 911 dispatcher is not for everybody. You know, I, I've had people, we had one person that was a dispatcher for, I don't know, 10, 12 years or so. And then she went and got her peace officer's license, became a police officer, worked there for several years, and, and she came back one day and she's like, you know, I don't know how I did it. I, I couldn't do this job anymore. So being in net control is a great responsibility, is very stressful, is um, very meticulous um, and stuff like that. Um, you know, if you're a good planner, maybe you can uh, help build a emergency plan or a disaster training or a roundtable event or something like that that you can use to train other people with. Maybe you're a teacher. Maybe you enjoy teaching other people and you can uh, talk about or um, give a class on something. So I guess really the key thing that I'm trying to get there is make sure that you tell your local agency what you're good at, what you like doing, or what you would like to learn about. And if there's a need there, then, you know, there you go. You, you know what you're going to be doing. Um, you know, as amateur radio operators, our key thing that we do is communications. And communications is, is a very key part, uh, key part of any disaster. And taking accurate communications and passing them on is, is very, 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 very important. You know, it may just be a simple message, you know, I need uh, more blankets over at shelter one it may be something simple it may be maybe you have a um a, a father that is that is in a um, a disaster area and and the cell phones are down and can't get a hold of his his kids and he needs to send a message out to his kids to tell him that he's okay you know that's something else that we do health and wef- health and welfare traffic and typically it, a lot of this is done through like the national traffic system or NTS. And we talked about that um, several episodes ago as well. And I will have a link to it in the show notes uh, so you can go back and listen to it if you want. Um, but basically with using the national traffic system, there is a, f- a specific format or a specific form that you need to use in order to do this. And that's the radiogram format. Um, you can find that online. I'll uh, try and uh, include a link as well in the show notes. 
to the national traffic system and to the radiogram to see to, so that you can see what it is if you've never seen one before. Um, something else that um, that we need to really focus on is is making sure that you speak clearly, you speak concisely, you pass the information in a timely manner. Uh, that you don't hem haw around, that you don't do like I do several times in this podcast, say ums or uh or well or you know something. Get on, get your mass your message uh, passed and get off. You know, just like with anything that you any kind of disaster or emergency situation, figure out what you're going to say beforehand, say it, and clear the frequency because there might be somebody else that needs to talk. So, um, you know, using a specific format, speaking clearly. And slowly enough to where the other person can write this information down is probably the two most important things when it comes to passing traffic or communicating because that's what we do, right? Now, the last thing I'm going to talk about with uh, Aries is planning. You know, uh, we talked about it a little bit before what the with the local level, but pre-disaster planning is is like I said the probably the second most important thing in any Aries organization. Plan before a disaster happens. It allows uh, the organization to identify those that may need an amateur radio communications in their whatever they're doing, whether it's a shelter, whether it's a fire station, whatever. After you've identified the needs of the served agencies, figure out what you're going to do to provide that, uh, provide for that need. You know, are you going to put a um, uh, a ham net? Uh, node at that location or you want to put a amateur radio operator at the location what are you going to do figure out what you're going to do and write it down for sure write it down um, and once you have this figured out the next thing that you need to do is to act upon it you know don't wait until a disaster happens to act upon it do drills do roundtable events do do something so that you're practicing what you're what you're preaching so to speak um, you know set up a drill with your served agencies, you know, once a year, twice a year, something like that, and follow that plan, work out the bugs with it, and afterwards you can sit down and say, okay, well, this worked, but this didn't, so let's change this. So, yeah, just make sure that you, you know, do something like that. And if you're very organized, this is probably something you can do. Um, that pretty much wraps it up um, as far as Aries goes. There is so much more information out there, and there I have included some further reading on the show notes of today's uh, episode uh, to the ARRL, the Aries uh, manual and the Aries, uh, the um, field resource manual that are published by the ARRL. Both of them are like, I don't know, one of them is I think 90 pages and the other one's like 20 some odd pages or something like that. And I've I've read them before. I'm reading them again as as I was doing um, research for this episode, but a lot of information on there. So make sure that you check those those links out. Um, you can simply go to uh, awrl.org forward slash Aries and get the information, or you can go to the show notes of today's episode, which you can find at everythinghamradio.com forward slash podcast forward slash 48 and get those. So, Um, I guess that pretty much wraps up our Tech Corner for this episode. Let's go ahead and move on to the next segment. Okay, so next up we're talking about the Bridgeland Amateur Radio Club in our Amateur Radio Club Spotlight. You can find them online at barconline.org. The Bridgeland Amateur Radio Club is in Logan, Utah. They have a meeting on the second Saturday of each month from January through May and in November at 10 a.m. on the third floor of the uh, Cache County Sheriff's Office that's located at 1225 West 200 North in Logan, Utah. During the other months, um, June, July, August, September, October, and December, they have other events, stuff like field day, uh, QSO parties, uh, Christmas parties, several things like that that they consider as club meetings. They have uh, several repeaters. Um, they have a 146.72 repeater. It has a PL of 103.5 located there in Mount Logan. And it's linked to four other repeaters as well. They have a 449.625 repeater with a PL of 103.5. And it's also in Mount Logan and linked to th- three other repeaters. Uh, they have a 145.31 um, and it has a PL of 103.5. It's located in Red Spur, 
west of Randolph, and it links to the two previous I talked about. And last but not least, the 147.26 repeater with the PL of 103.5 that's in Promontory, um, and it's linked to the three previous. So all four of the first ones that I just talked about are linked together. Uh, they have a 146.64 repeater. It does not have a PL, and it's located in Logan Valley floor. And a 147.2 with a PL of 103.5, also located in Valley 4. This repeater has a IRLP link of 3381. Um, they also have a Echo Link station set up at uh, 49, and the node number is 495125. Again, that's 495125. And last but not least, they have a 449.65 repeater with a PL of 100, and it's in Mount Pisgah. Inner Mount, uh, it's the Inner Mountain Inner Tide Link repeater. Um, they have several nets. They have a weekly Bridgeland Amateur Radio Club net that's held every Tuesday at 9 p.m. local time on the 146.72 repeater. Of course, it's linked to four other repeaters as well, I believe. Yes, it is. Um, so, um, let's see. They have a the BARC Ladies net every second and fourth Tuesday at 8 p.m. on the repeater link system. They have the Northern Utah Technical Society uh, D-Star Net on Sunday evenings at 8 p.m. Mountain Time, and it's on several repeaters as well. Uh, it's on, let's see, D-Star Reflector 029, the C Charlie. Um, they have a Beehive Utah Net daily at 12.30 p.m. local time, and it's on 7.272 megahertz. And this club seems to be fairly active. They do several... Uh, like QSO party stuff like that. They do field day. Uh, they have a uh, ham fest uh, that they call Swaptoberfest. It's in October, I believe. Um, they have uh, top of the top of Utah Marathon. They have the Bear 100 that they provide communications for, and it's a hundred mile bike race, I believe. Uh, they have the L O T O J A bike race, which is like 226 miles, I believe. I read. Uh, off the top of my head, um, that they provide communications for. Um, they have a Little Red Riding Hood bike race that is for ladies only. And they also have this really this other interesting thing that I, I was reading about a little bit, and I'd really like to learn more about it. And it's called Rocket Recovery is what they call it on their website. And uh, from what I understand, they go out several several miles from where they're at. Uh, it actually said this is the farthest event that they go for. And they do tracking for rockets uh, and I don't know if it's them that put up the rockets or if it's somebody else that does the rockets but they they do tracking for it so um, very interesting club if you're ever in the Logan Utah area or anywhere that they have repeater or if you want to hit them up on echo link or IRLP or D star uh, make sure you tell them that you heard of their club on the everything ham radio podcast so let's go ahead and move on to our events Okay, so before we get started on our events, I've got a couple quick things I want to talk to you about. Um, in the survey that I told you all about earlier, one of the recommendations was is to not read every single solitary event or uh, QSA party or a contest or whatever that's coming up. That it kind of gets a little boring, and I really totally agree with that. Um, I mean, if you notice the um, the NCCC sprint and the NCCC RTTY sprint are like every week. And so I'm, I'm thinking that rather than doing everything, I'm just going to hit the major points. Um, and you know, whether it's like a once a year thing or a major QSO party or whatever, I'm not going to do the every the weekly thing because it just really gets boring, so to speak. And especially when you have two or three of them on the same uh, podcast episode. So I'm not going to do all the weekly ones anymore. Uh, so hopefully y'all will like it better. Um, also, every every time that we mention it is going to be in Zulu time unless otherwise uh, specified. So um, on to the events. Uh, first off, we have the Russian 160 meter contest. It's on the 16th of December from 20 hundred hours to the 17th at 24 hundred hours. We have the AGB Party Contest on the 16th from 2100 to 2400. We have the uh, OKDX RTTY Contest on December 17th from 0100 to 2400 hours. 
We have the RAC Winter Contest on the 17th from 0 hundred to 23.59. We have the uh, Padang DX Contest on the 17th from 1200 hours to 23.59. We have the Croatian CW Contest on December the 17th from 1400 hours to the 18th at 1400 hours. We have the Stu Perry Top Band Challenge. December 17th from 1500 to the 18th at 1500. Uh, we have the AWRL Rookie Roundup on CW uh, for on the 18th from 1800 to 23.59. Uh, let's see, we have the Run for the Bacon QRP contest December 19th from 2 to 400 hours. We have the, let's see, next on the list, we have the RAEM contest. On Christmas Day from 0 hundred hours to 11.59, we have the DARC Christmas Contest on the 26th from 8.30 to 10.59, and that pretty much wraps up the events for this episode. Okay, so HandFest for the next two weeks is very, very limited. There's only one, actually, and it's on the 17th, which is um, this coming Saturday, I believe. Um, and it's in Minden, Louisiana, and it's the MARA Annual Christmas Hand Fest. And that's it. That's the only hand fest between now and the, and the end of the year, which is totally understandable since it's Christmas, but still. Anyways, that's it. <laughs> um, all the information that was taken on the events calendar was taken from the WA7BNM contest calendar and on the HamFest from the AWRL HamFest calendar. So that wraps that up. Let's go ahead and get on with the last section, which is the news. The word emergency. It means something unexpected has gone terribly wrong. Normal ways of doing things are not working. The fastest way to turn an emergency into a full disaster is to lose communications. Ham radio people understand emergencies. For over 70 years, they have provided free emergency communications for organizations. Ham radio, when normal ways of communications fail or get overloaded. The Amateur Radio Emergency Service. We'll be there. All right, that little public announcement was made by the AWRL. Uh, I wanted to play that a little bit earlier in the episode, but I actually forgot all about it. So um, that is basically what we're about as far as the emergency side of it. So, um, okay, so let's go ahead and get on with the news. Um, first off, the AWRL vows to continue pursuit of the Amateur Radio Parity Act in the 115th Congress. So there's been a lot of talk about this. I'm not going to read a whole any really anything about the um, what's going on with this, but basically, um, Congress is um, out for Christmas, right? And it, it actually closed on the 9th is actually when uh, the 114th Congress for the U.S. drew to a close. So nothing really happened with it it passed in the house of representative but it didn't pass in the senate if i'm not mistaken and so basically it just died that bill died there it's not going to move forward anymore i mean it'll have to be reintroduced next session um in january i believe so basically what happened to it is that you know it passed the house of representative by a unanimous vote but it stalled in the Senate due to the intervention of only one member, Senator Bill Nelson of Florida. So all y'all Floridians down there, make sure you write him and say, hey, what's up with that? You know, let's get the same pass next time. So he has, over the course of the past year, received thousands of emails, letters, and phone calls concern, uh, concerned or from concerned constituents asking for his support. He's had numerous meetings that were held with the senior staff in effort to move the legislation forward. Negotiations which led to an agreement with the National Association of Homeowners Association and public, uh, publicly supported by the CAI and the AWRL were brushed aside by Senator Nelson as irrelevant. Uh, in a final meeting with Senator Snaff earlier this week, it became clear that no matter what was said or done, the Senator opposed the bill and refused to allow it to move forward. Unfortunately, as the bill did not receive floor time, the only manner in which it could be passed in the Senate would be through the process of required unanimous consent, which means no one opposed the bill. 
Uh, the legislation will be introduced into both the House and the Congress and after the 115th session begins in January. Um, and it says, we've, only, we've already been in contact with the sponsors of the bill to allow for an early introduction, which will give us more time to ex- obtain success. We believe that we can get this bill adopted given the fact that we're inches away from crossing the goal line. We will continue to need support from the membership, particularly in Florida, as we go forward through the next year. So it, it's sad that one little, one senator is what didn't get this passed. Um, you know, And I don't know exactly what you know about this bill. Um, and there is people that like it. There's people that don't like it. But, you know, here's my thing. The amateur radio hobby um, is, I'm not going to say totally geared, but it is definitely a major portion of amateur radio is is emergency communications. Now, you may not have or you may not see the the need for this. And, and being that, being an amateur radio operator in living in a, a homeowners association is extremely limited on what you can do. You know, some homeowner associations might let you put up a, an antenna, but, you know, some may not, and a lot of them don't. And that's what this bill was intended to do, to allow you to put up a reasonable antenna. And, you know, here's my question. I've heard a lot of people say that, well, you know, you entered this in, you enter into agreement with your homeowner association that this is what you will do. Now you're wanting the government to step in and make you, or make it where you don't have to follow what you signed. Okay, well, here's my thing. You know, people that live in major cities or in areas where homeowner associations um, go, you're limited to what you can do. You're limited on the areas that you can go. You're limited on the houses that you want unless you have a homeowner's association. So all those people out there that are saying, well, you didn't have to buy the house. Well, yeah, you're probably right. But here's the thing. You know, if, if I'm working someplace and everywhere around me within, say, you know, 50 miles or whatever has a homeowner association or lives in a neighborhood where I don't feel safe or I don't want to live, I'm not going to do that. I'm not going to drive, you know, 60 miles to live outside of a homeowner association. Now, I'm not saying that, you know, as hams, we should be allowed to put up whatever we want um, in a homeowner association. I'm not saying that at all. I'm saying give a little bit of leeway. Let us put up a vertical antenna, a vertical, um, you know, two meter 440 antenna and a long wire, you know, an an inverted V, like a G5R V junior or something like that. You know, something that is, is less intrusive than a satellite dish that's on every stinking house in the neighborhood. You know, how is a vertical antenna that's maybe, you know, an inch, inch and a half in diameter, how is that more noticeable than a 12 or 15 inch satellite dish that's mounted on the side of your house or on your roof? How is that more intrusive? You know, I can understand people saying, okay, well, you know, they're going to, you know, they're going to put up a tower. They're going to put this big HF beam on there. They're going to put this and they're going to have a whole bunch of that. And, you know, it's going to interfere with my TV. Well, guess what people, it doesn't. And if it does, we fix it. So get over yourself. Get over yourself, Senator Bill Nelson out of Florida. Get over yourself. Get behind this bill. Because I personally think, and y'all may not agree with me, all of y'all may not agree with me on this, but as amateur radio operators, we need to be able to help support our community. If we can't help from our home or can't put up an antenna that's less intrusive than a satellite dish, how is that fair? How is that helping us help you? You know, those people that are the naysayers are going to be the first person to call for help when something happens. So, yeah. So whatever this is, you know, I hope that it is reintroduced in January, and I hope that it passes unanimously in the House of Representatives again, and it passes, you know, it gets to the floor of the Senate and passes. And Senator... Uh, Senator Bill Nelson of Florida, I hope that it passes and you vote no for it and it's a slap in your face. I really do. But, yeah. Okay, off my soapbox now. (laughs) 
Okay, so next thing we're going to be talking about is um, in Canada, actually. Uh, Phil Anderson, VE3FAS, that's Victor Echo 3 Foxtrot Alpha Sierra, was named to the Canadian Amateur Radio Hall of Fame. I didn't even know this. things like this existed. You know, is there a uh, Hall of Fame for the U.S.? <laughs> you know, what do I have to do to get on it? No, I'm, I'm, I'm kidding. Um, anyways, in this article, they talk about how Phil Nelson was uh, announced that he was appointed to the Hall of Fame, which is awesome. And the reason was is for outstanding achievement and excellence of the highest degree from serious to sustained uh, services in amateur radio in Canada or to amateur radio at large. Um, Phil was licensed in 1961. Uh, he had a distinguished engineering career in the defense research and space design, after which he became an instructor at uh, Humber College. Uh, his amateur radio involvement includes 50 years of service with the National Traffic System and was awarded a prestigious Brass Ponder League medallion for outstanding achievement in passing third-party traffic. He served the National Traffic System Eastern Area and served as manager for the Eastern Canada, Canadian Net and Transcontinental Corps. Uh, he was also a QSL Bureau volunteer for 20 years. Uh, he will be formula formally inducted into the Hall of Fame at a club event in 2017. You know, this type of thing is 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 awesome. You know, hearing about people, what they do for this hobby, how they make it better, is, is something that really touches me. You know, as as a ham, as a um, a, a 911 operator, working in law enforcement and fire, you know, being a volunteer firefighter, um, all these things are things that are extremely needed, but are rarely um, mentioned about, are rarely talked about, are rarely, rarely uh, congratulated, or um, you know, ever really ever given like an attaboy. You know, it, and it's it's sad. So when I hear a story like this, it's like, yes, finally somebody said something, and finally got the recognition they deserve. You know, he may not think that he deserves it. I, I don't know. I haven't talked to him. Um, but just from reading this little news article on the ARRL, it gives me all, like, warm and fuzzy inside. <laughs> okay, so one last thing. And since this is a emergency um, episode, I, I found this article on ARRL, and I thought it was awesome. And, you know, it, it touches on two things that are very near and dear to me. One of which is emergency communications, and the other is youth. Um, I, you know, I'm, I'm very active in our emergency communications area here in my local, uh, in my county. And I'm also very active with the youth of my church. Um, so those two things are very near and dear to me. Uh, in this article, it states that 50 students from uh, Dominica were introduced to ham radio on November 23rd in the form of a simulated emergency drill conducted via the virtual amateur radio platform called HamSphere. And W1AW at ARRL headquarters monitored the exercise. HamSphere is a virtual amateur radio transceiver available for iOS and Android devices under supervision selected youth uh, teams completed competed for speed and accuracy in a hurricane emergency communications drill dubbed uh, Hamanica 2016 while becoming familiar with the virtual version of amateur radio. Uh, sponsoring the project was the Dominica, Dominica's National Telecommunications Regulatory Commission and NTRC Executive Director Craig Nesty and Engineer George James. Uh, J73GJ. They were on hand for the exercise. Uh, the ARRL Emergency Preparedness Manager Mike Corey K1, uh, KI1U observed Hamanica 2016 at W1AW using the Hamsphere 3.0 platform. Well known for DXers Marty Lane uh, OH2BH, an enthusiast Hamsphere supporter, and Brian McKenzie, I guess, K1LI. Uh, organized Hamanica 2016 and helped the to conduct the exercise. 
While in Dominica, Lane celebrated his 70th birthday on the air as J70BH. The exercise scenario was a hurricane about to make landfall on the island. Lane said that at one point the group conducted the ex- conducting the exercise had to evacuate the station on short notice. Lane said that the NRTC is producing a video about the training exercise and the event caught the attention of national television station which reported the story in prime time. I didn't even know that this existed. I didn't even know it know that Hamsphere what it was when I first read about it. And I'm really actually going to have to look into it because it's it seems like a really awesome thing. And I didn't like I said I don't know a whole lot about it, but to me it seems like this would be a awesome training um, medium to do like a round table event on or to do a um, a technician class or something along those lines you know it, it seems like this would be really awesome and I'm really going to have to look more into it so I can uh, potentially see what can be used at my local level or what can be used in, in the classes that I help teach or um, you know in our local Aries club so if you, if you know anything about it, please leave a comment in the show notes and let me know what you think. If you've used it before, what you think about it, so on and so forth. And I'm going to do some digging of my own. But, uh, yeah, so that pretty much wraps up uh, what I have to talk about in this episode. This is actually the second time they're recording it, and I'll get in a little bit more on that here in just a second. So, But hold on. Hold that thought. Okay, so like I said, this is actually the second time that I'm recording this episode. Um, the first time I actually recorded it, the information that I had to talk about in the notes and stuff uh, that I made for myself was actually from a blog post that I wrote back um, last year. And the more I got thinking about it, what I said, the more I realized that I was totally way off base. Um, I wasn't talking about Aries. I was, I, was, I was, but I wasn't. I was talking more, at least in the part that I talked about where uh, we're told about the organization and stuff, I was talking more about the actual managers themselves and the emergency coordinators. So I had to come back and re-record it. Of course, when I recorded the first time, it was like 10 o'clock at night, and I had you know been at work since 9 o'clock that morning, and and uh, so I was a little off my game. But now I'm, uh, so I'm re-recording it, and I hope it's a lot better Um I'm interested to see how this setup that I have works. Um, I actually probably should have tested it out before I recorded this episode. So hopefully it works good. I hope I hope that the sound of this uh, this episode is is on par with what it should be. Um, I'm actually thinking about putting in a picture of my quote unquote recording studio as well. So um, stay tuned for that. Um, another thing that I wanted to talk to y'all about, um, a couple of episodes ago I mentioned that I was working on getting some shirts made. Well, I haven't done that yet, um, and I don't remember if I said anything about it last episode or not, but I haven't got that yet. I'm still working on it, but it's probably going to be uh, around February or so before I can get that launched. So all of y'all that are looking for uh, t-shirts, hang in there, please. Be patient with me. I'm, I am still working on it. There's several things that I need to do beforehand. Um yeah, so that pretty much wraps it up. Uh, I want to thank each and every one of y'all for stopping by. Um, if you like what you heard here on my podcast, please share this with your friends. Um, give me a honest review on on uh, iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher Radio. Uh, give me a, a star review as well. Um, if you would like to help support this podcast, there are several ways you can do it. Uh, first off, you can go to my support page, which has all this information on how to do it. Um, and that's the everythinghamradio.com forward slash support. You can make a one-time donation through PayPal. And I'm actually going to try and... Uh, 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 one of my listeners actually told me that my PayPal link didn't work at the bottom of the episode. Um, I'm th- hoping that it works on the support page. I'll have to check in on that as well. Um, but you can send... Really easily, you can send me a... Um, uh, you can go to paypal.me forward slash everything ham radio and give me a one-time donation if you would so choose to. Um, you can also become a month, a per episode contributor through Patreon. Um, you can do a $1 donation for ep- every episode. If you like, it's automatically taken out, which would be $4 a day or $4 a month, which, you know, is like the price of a, uh, uh whatever that Starbucks coffee is. Yeah. Starbucks. That's what I'm thinking of. Um, and you can also shop through Amazon through my affiliate link. Um, and the instructions on how to do that are on that support page. Um, 
I, I might have to reword it because like somebody said they weren't able to find it, but um, it's real simple. There's a little link there where it says Amazon. You can click on it and it'll take you directly to Amazon and you'll start shopping. It's that easy. And basically all that does is it, it gives me a, a finder's fee or an advertiser's fee. Um, you won't notice anything different on your end, but I'll get a small commission for what for stuff that you buy. Um, if you haven't done so already, and if you would like to subscribe to my email list, you can do that. Super simple. Just go to the um, the show notes of today's episode, or you can go to everythinghamradio.com forward slash subscribe. Fill out a simple uh, couple question form, your email, your name, your call sign, stuff like that. Uh, click on the sign me up button, and you will get an email from me to confirm your subscription. I don't want you on my list if you don't want to be there on there, so that's why I do that second step. So um, just click on that link. Uh, to confirm that you want to receive emails from me. Not a whole lot goes down. Basically just um, uh, notifications on when I publish a new post or a new uh, new blog uh, post or a new podcast episode. Um, sometimes I send some extra stuff in there and I probably will start doing it once I get these shirts up. Maybe there will be some uh, deals for my email listeners or my email subscribers. Um, I'll probably also have some deals for you, my listeners. Um also, you can follow me on Facebook at facebook.com forward slash everything ham radio. That's the page for it for my podcast. Also, I have a group that I've set up, and, and that you can find at facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash everything ham radio. That makes it a little bit easier. I wish I would have set up the group in the first place, um, but it makes it a little bit easier to, um, con- uh, to converse with y'all and to interact with y'all than that page does. So, I wish I would have set that up at first. Um, I also have a YouTube channel. You can find it at youtube.com forward slash everything ham radio. Uh, it will have each of the episodes and will um, basically just have my logo on the screen. Uh, and that's pretty much it. I tried to do some other stuff, but it didn't really work out. It was a lot more work than I originally anticipated. I may go back to it after the first year. I don't know. But we will wait and see on that. Um, and last but not least, you can find me on Twitter at K5CLM, which is what I'm most active on. Um, links to all these can be found on the menu at the top of the page under social. And I guess that pretty much wraps it up. Uh, I don't really have a whole lot more to say with this episode, but I greatly appreciate each and every one of y'all uh, listening and supporting my podcast. And I guess until next time, this is K5CLM signing out. 73, y'all.